Hi. Hi, everybody. This is Joanne Manister uh, from our Science Goddess on Twitter. And uh, we're here again with Read Science. My co-host, Jeff Schomeyer, joins us from over near Washington, D.C. I'm in Champaign, Illinois. And Melissa Seveny <laughs> is joining us from Arizona, but not Phoenix, where it's ultra hot, right? So maybe No, no. Up in Flagstaff. Flagstaff <laughs> is good. <laughs> maybe a little cooler. So Melissa... Um, has written a book called Brave the Wild River and the untold story of two women who mapped the botany of the Grand Canyon. And I was really excited because actually I, I always check who's commenting. And we have <laughs> two former Read Science guests on here. So Nat Natalia Holt, who wrote uh, yeah. Rise of the Rocket Girls, and uh, Christy Ashwanden, who oh, nice. are good to go. Yeah, these are both great books, great guests. So they, Yes, they are. And I was really excited because Kevin Fedarko, I loved the Emerald Mile. Yes, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So anyway, so more about <laughs> Melissa instead of about everybody else. Uh, so <laughs> Melissa is a science journalist at KNAU, which is Arizona Public Radio. She has worked in water policy, sustainable agriculture, and space exploration makes sense because there's a few, uh, like, uh, why can't I planetary, not planetarium, observatories nearby, yeah. right? There so, are. And you are the author of Under Desert Skies and Mythical River, and you live in Flagstaff, at staff, as you already said. And I can't speak today, I think. So, yeah, <laughs> welcome. We're so glad to have you. And Thanks for I having me. Loved your book. Oh, good. Thank so, you. Well, hand it over to Jeff right now. Yeah, I'll say at the end that I love the book. So at the beginning, uh, <laughs> we have we have a narrative that is the backbone for our book. And I think it'd be nice to establish that. And so I thought maybe I'd ask us to begin, uh, if you would just give us an introduction to who these, these people, Clover and Jotter, are, what they what they were and how they got involved and how how this adventure came about. Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a, it's, it really is a, an amazing, true adventure story about two botanists who in 1938 decided that they were going to run the Colorado River, uh, more than 600 miles of the Colorado River through Cataract, Glen, and Grand Canyon. And uh, this was a, a bit of a wild thing to do at the time, um, but their goal was to make a plant collection and really the first ever formal plant collection for Western botany in this region, which at the time was quite remote and um, almost untouched by dams, not completely, but very different than the river we have today. And I, I stumbled across their names quite by chance. Um, their names are Elzada Clover and Lois Jotter. Um, Elzada Clover was the older of the two. She was a professor at the University of Michigan in botany. And Lois Jotter was one of her students and also a close friend. And she was the younger of the two. She was 24 years old when she decided to go on this wow. trip. And I was, really, I was really fascinated that I had never heard their names before. Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up in Arizona. I thought I knew a lot about this region and its history. And yet somehow I had never encountered these two women's names. And the more I, I dove into the story, the more fascinating it became. You know, they were doing this at a time when women were not expected to do this kind of thing, right? Either become scientists or go on whitewater rafting river trips. And so they were kind of forging new ground there and they were really driven by this desire to make this plant collection. And uh, it's a great adventure story, but also a lot of science and natural history in there as well. Um, and I was just, it was a lot of fun to write. That's, it, that's amazing. <laughs> Your doggies have joined us. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It may even, uh, I might venture that it was even fun to do the research for, I think. Uh, all the journals and the local things and the newspaper stories and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And you mentioned one thing, but there were a couple of things I thought it was worth establishing um, for anyone who might be listening about 1938 and how exceedingly odd it was for women to be doing this and how dangerous it was for anybody uh, to, to be doing this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, river running in the 1930s is not like it is today, where it's, you know, not exactly a common activity, but a lot of people go down the Colorado River today, and we've got these big rubber rafts and emergency radios and pretty decent food. 
Um, they didn't have any of that. So yeah, in the 1930s, so um, Elzada Clover and Lois Jodder were the first non-native women to run this stretch mm -hmm. of the river. And Elzada Clover described herself that way. She knew that this region had a long indigenous history. Um, Navajo and Hopi have stories of running this river long before non-native people came along and tried it. Um, so she she understood that history, but she it's not like she had someone to, to call up and ask like, what is it like for a woman to, to run this river? River, you know, she was doing something that was pretty outside the comfort zone of most women at the time. And there was a lot of focus from the press, from the journalists of the day on the fact that they were women, uh, especially a lot of focus on the fact that about a decade earlier, a woman named Bessie Hyde had attempted to do this mm -hmm. trip and had disappeared. But with her and husband, was, she didn't just... With her husband, yeah. with her husband, yes. So men, yeah, men can disappear women. too. <laughs> right. And it's so fascinating because the newspaper stories had these headlines that would say, woman lost on river, just ignoring the fact that her husband was lost too. And it was really used as kind of, it was shoved in Elzada and Lo Lois's faces as like, this is why women can't do this trip. You you're going to die if you do this trip. They were told that over and over again. So I, I really admired their courage in going anyway. Um, it was a rough trip between John Wesley Powell going down the river, who's the first non-native man to make the trip with his crew. That was in 1869. And they come along in 1938. So a span of what, 70 years, there's a dozen expeditions on yeah, record. Not that many. Okay. Not that many. And many of the people on those expeditions came back and wrote these really like harrowing accounts. You know, they were, they wrote these books that were like exaggerating the dangers and talking about how horrible the trip was. And that was what Elzada and Lois had to, to read to, to try to figure out what this trip was going to be like for them. And so they really went into this with the idea that it was incredibly dangerous and yet they wanted to go anyway. Um, they found a, a guy who was willing to take them. His name was Norm Nevels. And they scrapped together this kind of, you know, motley crew uh, of people who had never done any whitewater river rafting before. They handcrafted the boats in Mexican Hat, Utah. And they, they hauled them to Green River, Utah. And they put them in the water. And off they went. I don't think any of them really had a good idea of what they were getting into. So Norm Nevels, what an interesting guy. <laughs> you yeah. first think, oh my gosh, this is not going to go well. But <laughs> in the end, he's like an advocate for them. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was a fascinating character, right? About um, kind of contradicted, you know, some, some contradictions there. Um, I wouldn't say he was the most enlightened person, but he... He mm -hmm. was willing to take women, which was mm -hmm. unusual at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, most most river runners um, wouldn't, wouldn't have done that. And his idea was that he wanted to start a commercial river running business through the Grand Canyon, which wasn't being done at the time, right? Expeditions were being scrapped together to go through the Grand Canyon, but there was no way to just sign up for a commercial trip like you can do today. And so he wanted to start that. He hadn't done the Grand Canyon before. This was new to him as well. <laughs> And I think he realized that if he brought women along, right, mm. then people would feel like, oh, this is something anyone can do. Women it can do it. Safe. So it must be safe. And so that was kind of his attitude with bringing these two women along, uh, which, again, maybe not the most enlightened, but it, it did open this opportunity mm. for Elzada Clover and Lois Jodder to do this incredible thing that they really wanted to do. Oh, so yay, capitalism? <laughs> Maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yay, yeah, yay so. foolish people who don't know better or something. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, the, I mean, it's a nice, it's a great adventure story. But I was, after some time, I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds so familiar as a woman in science. Everything mm -hmm. is. You, you can't do, my golly, these ladies are going down the river. We yes. don't think that's very safe, you know, and everything was women, 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 and not scientists. They mm -hmm. are there to discover. And, and we hear this over and over again, women astronauts, women scientists, you know, they're all told, or, you know, or even the questions asked of these women reminded me a lot of questions asked of mm -hmm. scientist Sally Ride. Mm -hmm. You know, right. oh, so will you take makeup <laughs> you know, and will mm -hmm. you right. do this? And yeah. And it's like, you know, they could do what they want. Right. 
Um, mm -hmm. of, yeah. You're right. That, that to me was really the heart of the story was Clover and Jotter's desire to be taken seriously as botanists, to be seen as doing meaningful scientific work, to have the opportunity to do that work. And yet being constantly, you know, hitting this wall where people ignored their science and fixated mm -hmm. on their gender. And it was mm -hmm. a huge frustration to both of them during the trip and even for decades afterwards that their trip was being seen as kind of a publicity stunt, you know, uh, with these, you know, these women going along who were kind of like mascots, you know what I mean? Something to generate press. Uh, and that's not how they wanted to be seen. They wanted to be seen as scientists doing serious work. And I, you know, going into the story, I didn't really want to write about the sexism they faced. Like mm -hmm. I wanted it to be a science story. You know, I wanted to center it on the botanical collection they were making, which is still vitally important. Like the research they did matters. But of course, I think like Clover and Jotter discovered, I had to write about the sexism because mm -hmm. they kept being faced with it over and over again. I don't, I try not to hammer on it in the book, but I'm glad you noticed like, you know, yeah, the fact that they felt that they had to put makeup on in the mornings oh, yeah. when they're in the middle of the Grand Canyon, you know, um, journalists describing their physical ex appearance in great detail, mm -hmm. um, you know, including, and usually in kind of monstrous terms, like how sunburned they were and how the mm -hmm. skin was peeling off their face, you know, that kind of thing, not very flattering, right? And, you know, just smaller things like like men, strange men telling them to smile, you know, yeah. things like mm -hmm. that. It'd and, be so and, much cuter. <laughs> right, exactly. And Joanne's right. When, when you say it's familiar, it struck mm -hmm. me as familiar. When I first started this research, I, I wasn't really quite expecting that. I was thinking like, oh, it's going to be the 1930s. It's going to feel so antiquated and out of date. Mm -hmm. I really didn't like the deeper I got in, the more I was like, gosh, all of this stuff is still happening to women yeah. today who step outside, you know, society's bounds for them. Wow. And yet it seems like you couldn't really tell this story and avoid the sexism. That's just, it's yeah. just too much a yeah. part of it. And so, but then on the other hand, I had the distinct feeling, let's say, that talking, having, having two interesting women to write about this way yes. and including these stories was part of your enthusiasm for taking on this project. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that it's a story about a friendship between two women. Mm -hmm. I feel like we don't tell those stories very often. It's rare that I stumble across a, a book or a, a movie that centers a friendship between two women. And they yeah. were quite different. You know, there was a, a generation gap in age. Um, their personalities were quite different. Alzada Clover was kind of the, uh, the adventurous one, the daredevil. She loved going out into the wild country by herself and, you know, collecting cactus. That was her specialty, which I love about yeah. her. Like, you know, the, the spiniest, most uncomfortable plants you can imagine. Um, and yeah, and she was, you know, she could ride a horse, she could shoot a gun, you know, she was quite um, unusual for her era. She was not at all interested in romantic relationships or settling down and having kids, not not something that interested her. And Lois Jotter, the younger of the two, you know, she was doing um, more laboratory based work. She described herself as not particularly adventurous. I think I would push against that characteristic. Yeah. <laughs> she proved she, otherwise like, anyway. She proved otherwise. She called herself bookish. She uh, she would complain that she was a <laughs> klutz. She was always knocking things over, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and she was a little uh, uncertain about, she was 24 years old, which was a little past the age for getting married in the 1930s. Mm. And she was concerned about that. She did want to find a, a person to marry. Um, so they were very different personalities. They sometimes clashed or, you know, kind of rubbed each other the wrong way on this mm -hmm. trip. But at the heart, I think this is a, a story of a friendship to women who trusted each other and cared about each other and had this the shared goal of making this botanical collection. But and and Lois there... was close with her family, too. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of correspondence with her family. I'm so grateful to her for keeping all those letters. You know, she, yeah. she was kind of a pack rat. She kept everything that had to do with this trip, which isn't, you know, if you think about it, it's like one summer in her life when she's quite young, but um, you know, she kept all of that material all of her life and, and donated a lot of it to the archive here in Flagstaff at Northern Arizona university. And those letters were such a gift, you know, before the trip, she, wrote letters like weekly to her parents mm -hmm. and a few to her brother and other family members trying to convince them that this was going to be okay. 
you know, and they're quite concerned. Like they've read some things about the Colorado River that have, you know, freaked them out. And they're <laughs> very worried that she's not going to come back from this trip. And so she says things to them like, you know, the, the boats are really tested. That was untrue. Like, this was like <laughs> untested this night. You know, she was like the, you know, Norm Nevels, he's done this trip before. That was untrue. <laughs> he had never done the trip before. And yeah. I, I'm not sure like how much of that was like her being unaware of, you know, the mm. situation or how much of it was just her flat out lying to her family <laughs> to make them feel better about this idea. <laughs> So what they, was go ahead? What was two botanists doing? You know, what's the connection with the botany here? Just to be clear about that too. But why would they think it was important to go as botanists? So this this region along the river corridor hadn't been formally collected, right? Nobody had gone and made a made a formal plant collection in this region before, specifically mm -hmm. along the river corridor. So they had done the rim, maybe. I think there were plenty of botanists who were working yeah, on the rim country. Okay. Um, there was actually John Wesley Powell's sister, Ellen, had done uh, botanical work north of the Grand Canyon. I didn't decades, know that. Decades oh, earlier. Yeah. Okay. She's interesting all in her own right. And she even went a little way down river with them on their second trip down the river, John Wesley Powell's second trip. And then they, <laughs> they put her out, you know, like this is too dangerous for women. So, you know, if she had been able to go, then this collection would have been made almost yeah. a century earlier but that didn't happen. And so what um, Elzada Clover was interested in doing was essentially mapping what kind of plant life was in this area, because that would help her answer all kinds of questions. So she had questions about, you know, how the different deserts, there's like three different deserts in this region that meet right there at the Grand Canyon. She wanted to know how that plant life was sort of meeting and mingling. Mm -hmm. She wanted to know whether plants were able to move up or down the river corridor and mm -hmm. extend their ranges belong their typical ranges. Um, she wanted to track plant shifts with elevation. So when you're going down a river, you're going downhill and the elevation drops. And she knew in a general way that that changes the kinds of plants that can thrive in a particular place. But she didn't know specifically what that would look like along the river corridor. If you've ever had a chance to do a Grand Canyon trip, you'll you see this happen if you pay attention, right? Like the plant life changes really dramatically. You'll hit a moment where suddenly there's barrel cactus and suddenly mm -hmm. there's creosote or greasewood, you know. And so that was the kind of thing she wanted to be able to to map with this collection. And she was physically collecting the plants. She was cutting them, putting them between pieces of newspaper and then stacking them together and cinching them between pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. And she would mail any chance she got. There were two moments where they kind of had contact with the outside world on this 43 day journey. She would mail those bundles back to Michigan to make sure they survived. Right. Mm -hmm. She didn't know what was going to happen on the trip if they capsized or got lost or destroyed. Mm -hmm. So yes. she, that's how important this was to her to get this collection back to the university. So it's interesting to me, you mentioned something like ecosystem wasn't a word that was really in use. It just that's had right. sort of recently been um, presented. So yeah. they had to look at things, not just the, the plants, which was their focus, but like maybe how are animals participating in getting these plants in different places or Things That's like right. That, so. Yeah, that really surprised me. I There's a scene early in the book when they reach the Colorado River and Norm Nevels is looking at the river and uh, deciding how he's going to run the first rapid. And Elzada goes off and she, she collects some plants while she's waiting. And I was very curious when I got to that moment, like, what does she see? Like, what is she looking mm -hmm. at on this hillside? And so I started doing research about what people thought about plants in the 1930s. And I discovered that the word ecosystem was coined in a paper in 1935 by this guy named Arthur Tansley, but nobody was using it yet. Like mm -hmm. it was this pure scientific paper that nobody knew about and it wouldn't come into widespread use for several more decades. And so Elzada Clover never used the word ecosystem. She would say things like association or, you know, collection of plants, right? She would describe it in these other ways. And yet in her notes and in the scientific papers that she and Jodder published after this trip, she was doing ecosystem science, right? She was observing all kinds of interesting things. She talked about how 
the mice in the Grand Canyon would stuff their cheeks with seeds and then they would crawl up on the walls and some of those seeds would not get eaten. They would get, you know, stashed somewhere and they would grow. And this is how plants were moving around. Like today we think of that kind of observation as part of understanding how an ecosystem works, mm -hmm. the animals, the plants, the soil, the sunlight, the water, all of that together. She didn't have that vocabulary, and yet she was she was making these really mm -hmm. wonderful observations. Like lots of curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was insatiably curious about how the world <laughs> worked, how it was put together. And she was doing that at a time when, you know, she didn't really have a lot of a lot of information to tap into. She had to just go out and, and take a close look at what was happening. I see I have a, a, a reference here to Miriam's seven life zones, which was the sort of leading way to classify everything. Let's hear mm -hmm. what that was about, because that really was just woefully inadequate. Um, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it is still it's still something that we talk about, especially here in the region where I am today. Um, you know, in the late 1800s, this guy named Seahart Merriam came out to Arizona and he spent some time here in Flagstaff where I am and in the Grand Canyon and he created this system called yeah, that he called life zones you can mm -hmm. kind of think of it as like a proto ecosystem idea or like basically there are these bands of plant life that you know if you start at like the bottom of the grand canyon you're in desert and as you climb up if you've ever done the hike to the rim you know as you climb up eventually you get into like pinyon juniper woodland and then if you keep climbing up a mountain you get you know into pines and conifers and his idea was that this it kind of mimicked if you did a hike from Canada to Mexico, right, you would see those mm -hmm. life zones, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this was a great idea and everybody really loved it for a long time, but then eventually people started questioning it. And around the 1930s, uh, ecologists started saying, well, I don't think this really works very well, except in these specific circumstances in the West. So Alzada Clover was familiar with this research and she wanted to kind of test it as she was going mm -hmm. down the Grand Canyon. And what she learned in the Grand Canyon was like, you know, that's uh, that's good as far as it goes, but it didn't really describe what she was seeing. And today we would we would talk about microhabitats. She didn't have the mm -hmm. vocabulary, but she talked about how um, something as small as like the angle of the slope would change mm -hmm. the kinds of plants that could thrive there. You know, the angle of the sunlight hitting the slope. She was describing what what now we would think of as microhabitats, and in her in her scientific paper, she basically said like, "Well, I'm going to set aside the life zones, and I'm going to just kind of tell you what I saw mm -hmm. in terms of plants that thrive on the river's edge and plants that thrive on these steep slopes that constantly have landslides." And she talked about how plants had learned to adapt to this really incredibly difficult situation that they have, where they're they're coping with landslides and floods and drought and all of these other things. This is fairly early in the life of the National Park Service, too, mm -hmm. uh, who yes. is charged with overseeing the Grand Canyon, or at least parts of it. Uh, and you had some very interesting things to say about their attitudes about uh, management, discovering what their, their uh, mission was, and uh, the sort of continuous pronouncements about the pristine, untouched by human hands Grand Canyon, which of course is so far from the truth. Um, if you would uh, give me your opinion about that. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to push back against this idea that the Grand Canyon, or really any place, right, is this is untouched. Pristine. By pristine right this is yeah. i mean this is racist language first of all right because mm -hmm. um you know the wallapai the havasupai the navajo the hopi um there's 11 the tribes the tribes affiliated with the grand canyon who have not only been living in this region and collecting the plants they've been cultivating the plants mm -hmm. right i mean agave prickly pear these are plants that are actually cultivated for food food and fiber and the shapes that they are today is because of of the influence of these tribes. And I found that really fascinating. Um, at the In the 1930s, of course, the National Park Service was uh, still displacing, forcibly displacing tribes mm -hmm. from the Grand Canyon and from other park lands. And they really were cultivating this idea that the parks were these untouched, pristine places. And they were doing that by removing the people who had stewarded these landscapes for generations. And so, you know, that's... that's <laughs> That's the main problem, right? With this this vision that the National yeah. Park 
had in the 1930s. And there was also a very interesting kind of dismissal of the idea of doing any kind of science-based management. Mm -hmm. There was a guy mm -hmm. named George Wright in the 1930s. Yes. He was very interesting. He was fascinating. Yeah, he, he was advocating for the parks to, to do science, to do botanical surveys. And, you know, he himself was doing surveys of the animal life at, at the parks. And he wanted to use that information to manage the parks, you know, in a kind of a science based way. And the Park Service really wasn't all that interested. They made a couple of steps fo forward at that time, but they were really more interested in sort of like creating the parks as like a tourist attraction, mm -hmm. right? So if there was an interesting animal that maybe didn't belong in the Grand Canyon, but <laughs> you would might like to see it, they were all for just like moving it in. So they had moved mm -hmm. pronghorn into the, you know, the middle of the Grand Canyon because they thought tourists might like to see pronghorn there, even though it wasn't their natural habitat. They were doing a lot of that sort of thing. And I found that quite fascinating i think you know i think the survey that clover and jotter were were putting together could have been quite useful mm -hmm. for example they were cataloging non-native species that had already moved into right. the river channel and yet there really wasn't at the time any interest from the park service in in using this science in any way for management mm -hmm. that right right at the time would have would have objective he would have talked he would have thought about the relationship of the indigenous prey and the predators and things and ma maintaining that healthy ecosystem that we've called today, as opposed to this vision by the Park Service. And here's another another little fact quotation that you, you wrote about to remind us that it was 1938. You said the Grand Canyon Park was created in 1919 and had more than 330,000 people visiting in 1938. The year when Clover and Jada were doing the thing, there was no native land use. And as you say, natives were being displaced wholesale because they obviously didn't have anything to contribute. And that blacks and whites were strictly separated in the park. Right. Yeah. This was still an era where there was segregation oh, in yeah. many parts. Um, and, and yes, an era when the, the Havasupai people had just really recently been forcibly removed from their homelands in the Grand Canyon. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it was it was certainly an interesting time for the National Park Service. And I, I wanted to deconstruct some of the myths about mm -hmm. the Park Service. You know, this idea that we could, you know, as, as George Wright said, you know, like he, the idea that we could draw a square around a piece of land and be like, yes. well, this we won't touch this and it'll be fine. You know, it's a very mis misguided and strange concept. Now, you did have some stories. Didn't you have a story of what was it El Zeta visiting? Uh, but anyway, it's sort of a rapprochement with some of the, the native people nearby to talk to them about uh, plants and, and things that, and their experiences yeah. and, and learn from that. That was El a later Zeta, time. But. That was later. Yeah, the following year, El Zeta Clover came back to the Grand Canyon, not for a river trip, but to to kind of fill in her plant collection by hiking and on horseback and on mule. And one of the things that she did during that time was she spent, I think a few months um, down in the Canyon with the Havasupai people at, at Havasu village. And I think that really, I don't have a lot of information about, about the, her time there. She wasn't keeping a diary at the time, at least not once mm -hmm. that she saved. But I, I suspect that that was the time when she really understood the long indigenous history of this region and um, and I, I'm guessing from that moment on is when she started telling people, please don't call me the first woman to do the river trip. I'm the first mm -hmm. non-native woman to do this. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, so the non-native non uh, people who came by, mostly white, but maybe a few black people. I On think. river trips? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly, yeah, almost all white men between John Wesley Powell and Clover and Jotter going down, uh, almost exclusively white men, with a few exceptions. Um, there were a, a few black men on one of the trip um, who rafted the river. And I think uh, I want to say a, a Hispanic man as well. Um, so there were a couple of ex exceptions to that, but not very many. This was very much an activity that was presumed to be something that only white men did. So, and it cost money to do this kind of trip oh yes no. it was quite how, expensive how did them. they get uh you know did they have scientific grants like we did we do now 
Right. Elzetta Clover attempted to apply for a grant from her university for, for the cost of the trip. Um, they all they they all split the cost and they all had to put up $200, which was mm -hmm. quite a lot of money at the mm -hmm. time, especially for the very low salaries that both these women made. And uh, Lois actually borrowed the money, I should put it in quotes, borrowed the money from her, her father. She never paid it back, so it wasn't really a loan. Um, but Alzada Clover attempted to apply for a grant. And she it was interesting, her letters at the time, she was incredibly nervous about that. And her grant application, she made it like trying to make it sound as like safe and normal as possible to go <laughs> run the Colorado River because she was worried that they would deny her specifically because she was a woman and because this mm. was something women weren't supposed to do. And they did eventually give her the money. They downgraded the amount a little bit, but they gave her enough money to cover kind of her share of the boats and supplies and enough money to buy a, a movie camera to take with them. So that was cool. So she, she actually, amid all of the other things she had to do, she took some film footage of them going through the rapids. Oh, wow. Is that anywhere online or was that just you had to <laughs> Yeah. Um, it? <laughs> the original film is housed at the University of Michigan Archives um, okay. and some at Northern Arizona University as well, which isn't easily accessible to people. But there is an edited version that the University of Michigan put together. So if you Google, you know, El Zeta Clover's name in YouTube, it should come up and there's a little mm -hmm. short edited version that shows some of their their rapid experience and it's pretty eye-opening like watching these little tiny wooden boats just like crashing into these <laughs> <big waves. laughs> how those boats survived is just too hard to say i want could you could you relate the the part of the story about the uh the the half of the plant her plants collected that that uh, clover yes. left behind knowing that they would be safely mailed back to her and then the events that followed. Yeah, that was heartbreaking, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she stops twice to mail her plants back to Michigan. The first bundle goes out at Lee's Ferry at the head okay. of the Grand Canyon about halfway through the trip. And the second bundle is supposed to go out at Phantom Ranch, which is at the, the middle of the Grand Canyon at the bottom, right? They stop there where they can get like a good meal and take a break and they actually hike up to the rim and spend a few days on the rim. And at some point, during that experience, she left her bundle of plants down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon in someone's care. I don't know whose. I imagine maybe she handed it off to a ranger, but I have very mm -hmm. few details about how this happened exactly. And she goes on her merry way, thinking that it's all settled and taken care of. And when she comes back after the trip through the Grand Canyon, she discovers that they were never mailed. This bundle of plants has disappeared and she doesn't know where they are and she doesn't have a lot of time to try to trace the steps of what happened to her plant collection and you can imagine she's devastated right this is roughly a third of her plant collection that that got lost and this is what this is what she had risked her life to collect mm -hmm. right the, mm -hmm. the physical specimens are so important, right? They're going to be housed in herbaria. They're going to be available to researchers. They're going to be available for identification because she can't identify all of them right there in the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is pretty devastating. And it I, I can imagine even more so because of how often she was told that she wasn't doing serious scientific research, right? Mm -hmm. This is just fodder for her critics, right? And she gets them back. I, I'm not sure I want to tell you how she gets yeah, them back. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> it's oh. one of my favorite parts of the story, right? The the, least, the, the reason to establish that was to to tie up the end, which, well, maybe you don't want to give away, but Norm, Norm did seem to spend a lot of time saying someday these boats will end up in the Smithsonian. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, That's that was a kind of a wonderful gem in the story. So right? I was sort of... I was sort of gratified by your observation about what finally did make it to the Smithsonian. I love that as well. Yeah, they they would uh, they would sit around. You know, they're just daydreaming. You know, the way people do. And <laughs> and Norm would be like, someday these boat these boats are gonna this trip is so important, and these boats are so important. They're gonna be housed in the Smithsonian right next to Charles Lindbergh's plane. Mm -hmm. You know, right, like that right. was how he was thinking <laughs> about this, which admittedly is a little bit silly. Um, that never happened, but. No. <laughs> Some of Elzada Clover's cactus specimens are in the Smithsonian to this very day. That's right. It's amazing. Amazing. 
<laughs> I st okay, I have one more quotation here that I set aside. I'm trying to figure out what the context was. So I'm hoping if I read this to you and then my observation, you'll go, oh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> because I wrote in 1937, the expedition to Shore Temple uh, to look for divergent evolution. About that, you said the idea that species could go extinct was still a relatively yep. new one. Yeah. which I think is really interesting to talk That's about. Right. And my observation was, when I was reading this, imagination in the public got out of hand. Sensational stories followed. I, <laughs> I don't really remember yeah. what the sensational I, stories were. I, I know were. what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> I, it was interesting to me. So, you know, in, in addition to trying to understand, I wanted to understand what, like, you know, thoughts about ecology and ecosystems were in the 1930s. But I also wanted mm -hmm. to understand what people were thinking about the Grand Canyon, specifically like non-native people, you know, the kind of people who are reading these sensational news articles about the Grand Canyon, you know, people who didn't live there and know the region intimately, like the Havasupai or the Wallapai do, you know, what were they thinking about this place? And it was more ridiculous than I could have ever imagined, you know? So, so like in 1937, this expedition is sent into this Grand Canyon to this this kind of isolated bluff or plateau in in the canyon, with the idea that that maybe it had been isolated for so long that there were like extinct mm. creatures on top mm -hmm. of it, you know, that hadn't ever been like encountered by mm -hmm. anyone before. Like there could be mammoths or dinosaurs or something down there. This was in 1937, the year before their trip, you know, and. Mm. Some of this is probably them just kind of generating some press and having some fun, but there were definitely people who really thought this was a possibility. And of course they get there and what, what did they discover? They discover arrowheads, right? It's signs that yeah. humans have in fact been to this place before. Um, and chipmunks basically are the biggest <laughs> animal. Right? No dinosaurs roaming, but that was, that was a strange one. And earlier that year in 1938, there was another expedition that the park service um, sent into the Grand Canyon to search for these wild horses. There were these rumors that the wild horses within the Grand Canyon had been cut off from the outside world for so long that they had de-evolved and they were as, as small as coyotes, like little dog sized horses <laughs> running around in the Grand Canyon. And you know, some people were taking this seriously and they, they went looking for these horses. And of course um, they, they stopped first at the Havasupai and you know, the Havasupai are like, you come measure our horses. Like we've got some of these horses, <laughs> come, come measure them. And they do, and they're totally normal sized normal horses. Horse. Yeah, uh, yeah that's right. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so the biological concept of this isolationism does sometimes resort, uh, result in mm -hmm. smaller mm -hmm. versions of the animals. And I guess sure, it's like, there's no way to get out of the canyon. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an example of how science at the time was really kind of pressed into service for sensational stories, mm -hmm. like quasi right. real scientific ideas and concepts and theories would be warped into these really kind of crazy rumors, you know, and it, it shows maybe how little people knew the Grand Canyon, but also how eager the public was to think about mm -hmm. this place as being isolated and strange and crazy. And you saw some of this with the press coverage of what Elzada Clover was doing. Um, the, the press rarely mentioned that she was a botanist and that she was mm -hmm. collecting plants. But when they mm -hmm. did, it was usually something like, she's gone to collect botanical freaks in the Grand mm -hmm. Canyon. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, exaggerated and warped. And the, this was just how science was kind of treated by newspapers at the time. And I suspect so, and she speaking... was always referred to as a lady botanist in that, lady botanist. too. Lots of that, too. The lady yeah. botanist or just, or just the lady. The, lady, <laughs> right? just the, the, lady. Way, they, the way it was done. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about evolution. And at that time, they had built one thing. The, the Hoover Dam was just built. Mm -hmm. And Lake Mead is that, or Lake Powell? One of them was just filling Lake up. Mead. Lake, Lake Mead. Mead was filling up, yeah. And filling up, and yeah. So, so I guess uh, maybe both lady botanists were thinking that in the future the plant life could change. Did anybody ever return to go see what's happened? Yeah, that's so interesting because when they, so they end the trip at Lake Mead um, behind what was called Boulder Dam at the time. It's now right. called Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine as botanists like this fascinated them seeing this reservoir that was just starting to, to 
to fill up, they actually observed barrel cactus that were like rooted, but now beneath the waterline and just mm. the spines were sticking up above the surface. And they both wondered like, what's going to happen to this plant life now that we've got a lake here instead of a river here. Okay. And that was something Alzada Clover came back. I think it was a year or two later. Um, and I found a very tiny little newspaper article that said she had returned to Lake Mead to make a study of how the plant life was being affected mm. by the reservoir. But I never found anything after that. I never found a published paper yeah. or any other records. So I don't know if that work wasn't published or what happened with that research. But she was several decades ahead of her time in thinking about that question. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't until the 60s, the 70s, more so in the 90s, that scientists really started thinking about how the ecology of the region had changed because of dams. And so the fact that she asked that question back in 1938 was really fascinating to me. So the, um, why can't I think of the dam that the other dam had not been added to the Colorado River? Which one was it? Glen Canyon Dam. Glen Canyon, yep. Canyon Dam. I was like, Glen okay, Canyon that's Canyon. the one in Kevin Fedarko's book. I'm like, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> yeah, that hadn't even been added. So things even change within the Colorado River. Right. Yeah. Beyond so that, Glen Canyon uh, Dam goes up in the 1960s and right. it's like a bookend, right? You've got Glen right. Canyon upstream of the Grand Canyon. You've got Hoover Dam downstream, downstream. of the Grand Canyon. And dams really change everything about mm -hmm. the ecology. Um, so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's fairly obvious that upstream you get a reservoir instead of a river. So Glen Canyon and Lower Cataract are now underneath water. Um, but down downstream from the Grand, from the dam, everything in the Grand Canyon has changed as well, right? The water is colder, it's clearer, its rhythms are mapped to hydropower needs. So yeah, instead yeah. of getting big floods and really low drought periods, you have a much higher and much steadier kind of rhythm in the river. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything about the ecology of the region. So in the 90s, scientists really started studying and asking questions about how that had changed and also how maybe they could reverse some of the damage, right? As people started mm -hmm. to right. feel like they wanted to protect the ecology of the Grand Canyon, how could we restore some semblance of what it was before? And as part of that research, um, the U.S. Geological Survey mounted an expedition down the Grand Canyon in 1994. They called it the Old Timers Trip. And the idea was they would get together a bunch of people who had run the Grand Canyon before Glen Canyon Dam went in and asked them to observe how the place had changed. And by this time, Elzada Clover had already passed away, but Lois Jotter was still alive. And she went on that trip for a second time. She was, I want to say, 83 years old. Wow. Mm. And wow. Grand Canyon a second time on a science expedition. Wow. That's One uh, little fact, I think it was about the new dam further up that you mentioned uh, as you were talking about it, how long it took to fill up the reservoir. Which I oh, think I, for that one was like seven years. I don't remember the number least. anymore, but, but it, it certainly took a while. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know what picture I had. Like you put up the dam, and like oh, in a month the reservoir fills up. I don't. I don't know. It was, like, it was interesting too. I I wrote down that you said Lake Mead was now. This is in 1938, 50 feet below the dam spillway. It would rise to capacity in 1941. Yeah. Right. But then you, yeah. you went on to say that there was so much drought and water demand as time passed that it would never again reach the top of the stillway, uh, except for maybe one winter in 1983 and 84. Right. That's the famous big water that Kevin Fredarko writes yeah, about right. in, in the Emerald Mile. So if you want to know that story, um, read the Emerald Mile. But so yeah. Good. Right. I mean, and now, of course, both those reservoirs are incredibly low, at historic low levels. We've been in drought here in the Southwest for 23 years, give or take. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there's a fair chance that they're, we're never going to see those those big water years, that high capacity again because of climate change. And no surprise to find out that the original surveyors and everyone who thought about the plans severely overestimated how much water would be available to the yeah. to the states doing the sure. the interstate compact thing but right yep that was all settled before clover and jotter came along in the 1920s yeah. the, the laws that divided up the river were serious they, they were relying on some serious overestimates or optimistic yeah, right. ideas about how much water there really is in the colorado river do you think I'm still thinking about people's attitudes and, and things in the 1938. It's like, do you think the people 
who would read be reading the newspapers and things had the view at the time that that doing this rafting trip shooting the rapids in the Colorado River was really 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 th life threatening dangerous or maybe just sort of roller co coaster dangerous or just an exaggeration to begin with there's a pretty clear break in what happens in the newspaper articles before and after 1938. Oh. <laughs> so before 1938, yes, the newspapers were being very clear that this was life-threatening, like really exaggerated numbers, but like half the people who have done this trip have died, like that mm -hmm. kind of thing, which is, wasn't mm -hmm. true. Um, but you know, the <laughs> Cataract Canyon, which is their the first place that they encounter on the Colorado River upstream of Grand Canyon um, was called the graveyard of the Colorado River. Dangerous. Yeah. It's horror stories, right? Total horror stories, which were quite exaggerated, but that was the perception that this was incredibly dangerous to do. And then 1938 happens and Clover and Jotter succeed at doing this trip. And it was fascinating to, to keep reading the newspaper articles that came afterwards. And they would say things like, well, Running this river is becoming quite safe now that women can do yes. it. Yeah, women can do it. <laughs> well, so, actually, <laughs> so one of my favorite things was when a plane <laughs> flew overhead and they dropped oh. pamphlets because they're like, we're looking for these geologists who oh, are in God. danger. <laughs> Wasn't that a wild story? Yeah, that's so in, in Cataract and Glen Canyon, they get delayed by about a week. They don't show up, at least Barry, when they say they're going to show up. And uh, yeah, the, the search planes are set out to, to search for this quote unquote lost party of, of scientists on the river. And yeah, drop they drop some leaflets on them trying to figure out if this is the party <laughs> they're looking for. Like who else would be down there? I don't know. <laughs> that, was, that was a wild story. So that, that was the kind of um, media frenzy that was stirred up by this trip, which certainly <laughs> Clover and Daughter were, were not expecting at all. Well, the signal the was fun, you know, not even botanists. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. If yeah. you're the party we're looking for, stand up and lean right. And if you're not the party we're looking for, lie down. Or, yeah. it, it all exactly. seemed a little bit silly, but it was a bit silly. They had to do some gymnastics to show, yeah, and the, the little leaflet <laughs> referred to them as a party of geologists, not botanists. So they didn't even really know who they were looking for. All they knew is like there's these women lost in the canyon somewhere. We better go look for them. Uh, so yeah, that was something that none of the women were expecting. And you can imagine, oh, their their friends and their family back home, just Anarchy. especially Lois Lois's family, just really really worried like they get to a point where the newspapers are reporting that they're dead you know the newspapers mm -hmm, yeah. are saying well we're sending out search planes to look for the wreckage right this is what the yeah. newspapers are saying yeah. must have been terrifying for all of the people waiting back home why why was a trip like this so dangerous in 1938 do you think well, I think a lot of it was just unfamiliarity with, mm -hmm. with the river, right? They they had maps, but they weren't maps designed for river trips. They were topographic maps that had been created for actually a survey of dam sites on the river mm -hmm. a decade or two earlier. And they on, the only reason they had access to those maps was because Lois Jodder, during her spring break yes. before the trip, went to Washington, D.C., where her father worked, and she met the man who had made those maps and and asked for copies because you couldn't just go buy them somewhere. Right. And he was reluctant. He didn't want to give it give the information to her. He was like, you're, you're a young lady. You shouldn't be doing this trip. So she had to talk him into it. She had to convince him that she was capable of doing this trip before she could get those maps. And so, you know, that's what they had to kind of show them what was coming up around the bend. Um, the boats were sort of an untested design. You know, Norm Nevels had scrapped together these boats called cataract boats that he hadn't used before. Um, you know, they just, they really, they didn't have the kind of equipment that we have today or the kind of knowledge that we have today of sort of how to tackle the rapids and what was coming up around the corner. And specifically for this trip, they hit it at very high water. Um, mm -hmm. They left mm -hmm. summertime. It's the rainy season in the West and it's a high water year. And that that contributes quite a bit to their experience of having very high waves and fast water and big rapids, all of which, which made it, I would imagine, pretty frightening for them. Yeah. 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 Plus, I guess they had no modern way to communicate with people outside. That too. No emergency radio. Uh, yeah. Nevels was supposed to bring an emergency radio. Those did exist, but somehow he, he never did. Um, I think he just couldn't obtain one, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, there's no, you know, there's no way to call for help if something goes wrong. Um, early in the trip, they, they lose a boat, right? A boat pulls yeah. away 
uh, right. from the riverbank and goes off goes off down river and uh, they they managed to chase it down and, and find it again but that that i assume carried about a third of their food supplies and it was right. at the very beginning of the trip i mean if they had lost that they would have been in real danger of going hungry on this journey so there were definitely real dangers that they they had to face mm-hmm. of course the, the newspaper articles often chimed in with, you know, among all these other dangers, the fact that there's women on the trip adds yeah. to the hazard. Yeah. They have to be oh, taken women. care of. Yeah. Right. Well, right. actually, then it's the women taking care of the men because yes. they did the cooking. They made the yes. coffee. They did but all a, of it. As usual, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and can you, and there was no discussion about that in advance yeah. in the letters mm-hmm. that the women would do the cooking. There was no like agreement. It was just a given that the women would do all the cooking in addition to the plant collecting that they need to do. Yeah, the guys would just stay in yeah. bed until the women had finished preparing breakfast. Finished building the fire, making the breakfast, pressing their plants, rolling up their bedrolls. Yeah, mm-hmm. all of that sometimes Taking would happen. Notes, you know. up. <laughs> Touching up their makeup. Oh, yes. And by the way, all of this without coffee, because Neville's decided not oh. to bring coffee on the trip. He brought oh, a substitute okay. called Postum, oh, which God. <laughs> did not taste like if you've had it before. I, I've never had it. but I've only heard about it, and it sounds horrible. It sounds pretty horrible. And I've since learned, I could tell in the letter that Elzada Clover wrote back to Neville's about the menu that she wasn't thrilled. Like She was kind of like, yeah. well, okay, I guess we don't need coffee. And I could kind of tell she wasn't thrilled, but I wasn't totally sure. And I've since learned, since the book came out, I, I um, encountered one of her former students who told me that she really loved coffee. Right. And so this was a big sacrifice for her oh, doing wow. this right. trip with coffee. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I, I guess um, I was thinking there was a point where they got out to rest and to the ladies, the lady botanist went to get the hair done or something. Mm-hmm. And that was like, the newspapers were all over that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they like followed. Uh, I guess it was Alzada Clover the day after the trip. She goes to a beauty parlor, you know, and uh, and the, the journalists follow her and they take photos of her. And uh, the headline the next day is um, uh, River Queen Seek Beauty, <laughs> right? And Clover was incredibly annoyed by this. I think not only for mm-hmm. the focus on her appearance rather right. than the science, but just being followed around by journalists while you're trying to just get your hair done. Very unpleasant. Yeah. Right. It, it's funny because it's a double standard. Well, aren't you going to wear makeup and be this dainty thing? And then, Oh wait, you're getting your make your hair done. It, right. Yeah. Yeah. Weird, uh, oh yeah, gosh. The standard focus, and, yeah. Right. The focus on their appearance was really startling <laughs> and maybe not startling. Maybe it was something I should have expected, but you know, I ran a, I ran across a radio interview they did where they were described in great detail what they were wearing and what they look like. Just them. The men mm-hmm. were interviewed as well, but the men's appearance was not mentioned. mentioned. Yeah. yeah. We see that in presidential elections and descriptions. We of see that scientists everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have uh, a couple of more toward the end sorts of things when... Uh, because they come from the end of the book too. But by then I was thinking about, you know, bigger questions and stuff. Uh, I'll make my observation in a minute, but uh, the first one, I wondered if you had an, a new answer, or any additional answer to your question. What would have happened, I wondered, if Clover and Jodder never ran the river, if they had listened to the critics and the doomsayers mm. or their own doubts? Yeah, I I thought about that question a lot as I was writing this book. You know, somebody sometime eventually would have come along and made mm-hmm. this plant collection, but the historical record shows us that that might not have happened before Glen Canyon Dam went up. Uh, when Glen Canyon mm. Dam went up, there was a sudden push to, to understand the region that was about to be flooded by Glen Canyon right. Dam. Um, and a lot of that focus was on archaeology. You know, there was there was a, um, a push to go in and try to salvage. It was called salvage what they could of the archaeology. But um, some work on plants, but not very much. Not this comprehensive look that Clover and Jotter took. So I, I think if they hadn't done this, which there were mm-hmm. a lot of reasons not to, there were plenty of chances to turn back. Sure. We wouldn't know as much as we know now about what this river used to look like, not only before yeah. the, the dam, but before um, all of these non-native species came into the corridor and before tourism and river rafting became a big business. You know, all of these changes have happened since the 1930s. And when I talk to botanists who work in this region today, they know who these women are and they mm-hmm. know the 
scientific papers they published and they cite to that work all the time because it is one of those data points we have for like this is what this place used to look like this is what it was like right at the moment when all of these changes were happening so as we're heading into a future where we're facing drought and climate change and drastic changes to the Colorado River Mm -hmm. I think those records matter I think it matters to know what this place used to look like before so we can try to decide how we want the mm-hmm. future of this river to look. Plus, citing the paper uh, keeps them alive in a way that right. scientists like to do, I think. It does. Um, it does. I found yeah, I love it. at the very, almost the very end, I wrote down to page 240, I found a, a sort of personal connection. I felt like you were talking right to me and I did not expect <laughs> it because we were talking earlier about uh, Alzada Clover's predilection for collecting cactus and mentioned that she was at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, but it was only when you said the Board of Regents at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, speaking later of Elzada Clover said, the superb cactus collection at the Botanical Gardens uh, here is her continuing monument. And then I was going to say, just 10 years ago, I was there and I saw that cactus collection, not realizing at the time, there was no brass oh. plaque that I saw, but I felt, I felt touched by that, it's like, oh my gosh, I saw Elzada's cactus there. And it really is a, a lovely, lovely, lovely collection. Um, oh, that's wonderful. I want to yeah. go see it. This was, this was my pandemic book. And so a lot of the things the travel right. wanted to do was not possible. And that was that was one thing on my to-do list that didn't happen because of the pandemic was to go sure. see that cactus collection. So I, hopefully one day I'll still get a chance to do that. It may so, have been- Oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just doing my wrap up, wrapping up thoughts because I was going to say, it may have been the way you wrote it. And I was going to say for this story, I'm really glad that you kept it strictly chronological. Yes. Thank you. And then (laughs) I had the feeling I got toward the end. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, it has been like that. I've been through every moment and uh, I read it over a fairly long period. It's like for weeks I was going down the river (laughs) with these people. (laughs) And I finished the book and I sort of smiled and I felt like I'd been on a journey of my own by the end of the book. I felt changed by having read the book, which I thought was really cool. Thank you. Thank (laughs) you for saying that. Yeah, sure. Now about that, I was going to say, you quote Clover as uh, mentioning a calm, true and dignified account of their adventures. And I wondered if you felt the book maybe uh, provided the calm, true and a dignified account that their adventures deserve. I hope so. I hope so. I, I found that letter that Alzada Clover wrote um, to Lois Jotter about a decade after the trip. I found it very late in my research process where she complained about how her story had been told and told Lois, like, what I want is a calm, true, dignified account of yes. our adventures. I was already mm-hmm. almost done with the book when I found that, but I, I really hope that I told the story in a way that Elzada and Lois would have wanted it to be told. Mm -hmm. I would guess, yes. I'm amazed because you mentioned, oh, something's in the Smithsonian and something's here and something's there and probably even on display somewhere in one of the Grand Canyon visitor centers. And I'm like, I could have walked past and not even known. Never known. So I'm super grateful you wrote this book. So we have this, you know, so I go, I mean, in my head, I guess, oh, somebody must have cataloged all this. (laughs) <laughs> not thinking who did this, who cataloged this botany, you know? And mm-hmm. so I'm glad it's all here in this book. And now you said you wrote two other books. Mm-hmm. Do you have another book in mind or did was not this yet. an obsession uh, for <laughs> enough of your life? <laughs> this was an obsession for a long time. I, I wrote it on Saturdays. I, I do have a full-time job. So it was my Saturday project for more than four years. And I'm going to need a little break before I find my, my new obsession. Um, but I, it did feel incredibly satisfying to tell this story and bring it to a wider wider audience. I I hope more people just know these women's names. I mean, that's what I would like Mm -hmm. for folks who go visit the Grand Canyon or who run the Colorado River to just know who these women were. And I hope it's inspiring to to all kinds of people who want to do science or who want to run rivers you know, to know that you don't have to fit into the box, right? You don't have to look a certain (laughs) way or be a certain way. You know, anybody can do this kind of work and have this kind of adventure. So that's what I'm hoping for. That's great. Uh, So speaking of 
books, finished books. I, I'm guessing this is in every single Grand Canyon bookstore now. Um, just, just uh, so I just got through the approval process, so they should be there shortly. Um, hey. I, uh, <laughs> look for it next time you're at the Grand Canyon. That's for sure. right. Sure. Well, I'm hoping. Well, last time I went, it was um, March and it had snowed, and yes, yeah, so we didn't do any hiking or stayed up at the rim. But I would love eventually to hike, and eventually it would be great to do a river ride. So oh, mm, I'm hope, yeah. I'm I'm so excited for when the paperback comes out because I'm hoping people stuff it in their mm -hmm. in their backpacks right. or bring yeah. it down the river with them, right? It'd be mm -hmm. so good. And of course there are pictures of the plants and some pictures from the archives of you know the photo taking and everything. So of the boats and the crew and yeah, it was good. It was a great story and I'm so very glad you wrote the book. And oh, we're thank very you so glad you joined us on our episode mm -hmm. here. So this was yep. a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks, so, Melissa. You've you've heard from us that we love this book, Brave the Wild River <laughs> by Melissa Sevigny. So if you can pick up a copy or I guess wait for the paperback and stuff it in your backpack to read yes. <laughs> when you have a break in hiking. So or the audiobook. There's an audio book. Well. Good idea. <laughs> oh, That's, right. That's right. All right. Thank you everybody. Thank you.